GetHope.tv. We want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to invite you wherever you are today just to join us in worship as we sing.
Well, hey, church, my name is Matt Curtis. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Community Church, and you are right where you need to be right now, wherever you're watching from, Hope at Home, uh, YouTube podcast, gethope.tv. This is the space. And let me tell you, we've got a lot to celebrate uh, this weekend. We are launching our Northwest Cary campus officially. If you remember, we've moved, relocated the campus from Morrisville over to Northwest Cary. That has been just a great undertaking. We have sought after God's wisdom and direction and provision. And today, this weekend, it's happening. We're super excited about that. More good news across all of our campuses, including Northwest Cary, uh, is baptism weekend. And I don't know all the numbers, but I know that just at the Apex campus, there are like 12 baptisms that are happening. And we can celebrate that whether you're online or not. You can clap for that because God is moving and people are taking steps in faith publicly to profess their commitment to Jesus. Uh, Well, look, you may recall this. A few weeks ago, we had Pastor John Aleeks from our partner campus down in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, come in uh, and just tell us about the state of Haiti, what Port-au-Prince alone has been through, and what Agape Church has gone through. And we have committed as a church to, on the 23rd of every month, slowing down and praying for our brothers and sisters in Haiti. And beyond that, so we did that on Thursday, but beyond that, if you're paying attention to anything outside of the triangle globally, there's just a lot of devastation. If you're paying attention to what's going on in Turkey, in Syria, uh, we are a year into war with Ukraine and Russia. So we just wanted to stow everything down and pray together. So will you pray with me, church? Father, you are our Father. You're a God who knows everything. You know the turmoil that your people are in across the world. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that would open our eyes beyond the triangle, beyond our own context, and we would see our brothers and sisters in Haiti and lift them up to you. We would see the brothers and sisters we have in Ukraine, in Russia, in Turkey, God, and we pray for peace. We pray that you, the God of provision, would show up in places in supernatural ways where we don't even know the details or the pain or the loss or the fear that our brothers and sisters are enduring, but you do. And you are a God of hope. You're the God of our brothers and sisters in Syria. You're the God of our brothers and sisters in Turkey. You're the God of provision in Haiti. You're the God of our brothers and sisters in Nicaragua. So God, we just put them before you Stand with them and say, God, we pray that you would show up in mighty ways that just today even they might have a little more peace, a little more rest, a little more hope in who you are. God, we trust that you work all things for your glory. So in all these things, we say in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me in that prayer. Uh, Well, look, we are starting a new series this weekend called Rhythm that is all about uh, seeing ourselves as missionaries, right? Seeing ourselves uh, being missional, where we live, work, learn, play, shop, all of those things. Uh, And today we're gonna be hearing about what does it look like for us to be missional where we eat? We're gonna be hearing from uh, Pastor Chase Gardner, which is super exciting. But before we get there, we've got a quick story for you uh, from a friend of ours named Clever who attends this church. Please check out this video. Rise Up is a group that we formed at Mako, so it's primarily Mako employees. The purpose of Rise Up is to take real world problems, real world things that people are dealing with. So anxiety, stress, relationships, and then so we give the practical application to people that could be going through that day to day, and then we come across it with a, a biblical application as well. The idea generated, um, I would go back as far as eight years ago when we first started the company, started a small Bible study. um, And then from that um, Bible study and that foundation is where Rise Up grew from. I think one of the things we were convicted and we wanted to do is how do we have a bigger impact with, you know, Mako has over a thousand employees. And one of the things we were saying is, man, we're doing these Bible studies and there's six of us, there's eight of us. Like, how do we how do we cast a larger net? We talked about the fact that Mako from the beginning, since we started the company, is all about reaching out, making an impact. And we were doing that out in the community by hiring veterans and, and by giving to charities. We were doing a great job externally, but then we all saw the opportunity to do something internally. What are we doing for our own team members, our own Mako employees? 
And that's when we began to realize we, we could do something here that's, that's gonna provide uh, something meaningful in their lives. We want to build a program that people get excited about and that they're a part of um, and that they feel like this sense of community. We see people taking their burdens and talking to our speakers afterwards and opening up. About a month ago, our last speaker, Dave Lanuti, um, preached a powerful series. And on the last week, actually, he was he was called to, you know, call people to basically follow Christ. And three people raised their hand to accept, accept Christ that day. So it was really special to see how it can kind of build to that. Our whole purpose is to bring people to Christ, right? Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about Adam, it's not about Bob, it's not about Clover, but what can we do to build a relationship? Either if you have a relationship with Jesus, how do we make it stronger? Or how do we give you the tools to make it stronger? And then if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we're gonna introduce you to him. Uh, and so that's what's important to us at the end of the day. What can we do to introduce you to Christ? For me, I think this has kind of changed my perspective a little bit, but I've always thought about like, what can I start? Like, what does God need me to start to like help impact the kingdom? And I think for this, it's like, where is God already working? It's allowed me to say, you know what? I don't need to go start this crusade. Like. God doesn't need me to do that. He, he needs me to be at work where he's already at work and he's already at work at Mako. We look at Rise Up eight years from now, we're like, one person got saved because of Rise Up, success. We ready to lift the name of Jesus? Is anyone excited that Jesus is still alive? Yeah, he's sitting at the right hand of God right now. We're gonna raise a hallelujah church, come on. And I raise a hallelujah, oh, y'all can't say, in the presence of my enemies, yeah. And I raise a hallelujah, louder, louder than the unbelief, I raise, I raise.
All right, church, will you join me in praying? Father, we do. We raise a hallelujah. Uh, We thank you that you are our God and we are your people, Lord. And we just pray that we would continue to grow in our trust of you as our good shepherd. Uh, And everything, all the noise that's going on, uh, the circumstances we're in, the burdens that we're feeling right now, I pray that your church would just shut those things out, hand them over to you, and we would lean in to your truth. God, that we would be mindful of your goodness, of your grace, your mercy, God, your sovereignty over our circumstances, Lord, and we would draw in to your holiness in this moment. So, Lord, sharpen us, and I pray by the end uh, of these moments, Lord, that our trust and our faith in you, we would believe you are who you say you are, and you will continue to do what you have always done. It is in Jesus' name we say amen. Rhythm, we're starting a brand new series that we'll call, uh, call them Rhythm. That'll make sense uh, in a little while, but uh, you know, I get to stand backstage and whenever the worship leader asks you guys to clap, I can see you. And so some of y'all got rhythm, which is awesome. Some of y'all think that you have rhythm and you don't. And some of y'all just know you don't have rhythm. So when the worship leader says do this, you're like, no, you don't want me to do that. Like I'm gonna mess everyone up. So we're gonna do a little rhythm practice before we get into this series. That sound good. I've invited my friend Chris Crowder, indeed, to the stage. Everybody give Chris a hand. Chris is going to lay, just lay down a 4-4 beat for us. Just 4-4. Chris plays everything, man. He plays keys. He plays bass. He plays guitar. I think drums is like his fourth instrument. But see, this is 4-4, which means there are four beats per measure, and the quarter note gets the beat. You feel it? So one, two, three. Let's clap on the one. Ready? Four. One. There you go. Again. Good. One more time. All right, let's add the three, the one and the three. One. Two. That's what worship leaders want you to do, okay? One and the three. Clap on the two and the four. Not that. Don't do this during worship, please. One, two, three, four. Let's do the four and the one. Ready? One, two, three. Good. A little bit early. Good. That's awesome. All right. You want to try to throw them off a little bit? We're just going to do this. Next week's going to be a lot more complicated. Try 7-4, man. You might have to think about it a little bit. Get into that. Five, six. That's five. We'll do five. Keep, keep going. Keep going. We'll do five. Five, four. Two, three, four. All right. That's just five, four. There's five beats per measure. Let's just see if you can, if you can uh, clap on the one. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. All right, let's start with five. One, two, three, four. Okay. That's awesome. Give Chris a hand. You guys are doing great. That made me work on my rhythm. We might mix it up a little bit next week, but rhythm, rhythm. Our lives are composed of rhythms, right? The sun goes up, the sun goes down. The sun goes up and the sun goes down. The moon, it waxes and it wanes, and it waxes, and it wanes, and the days get longer, then they get shorter, then they get longer again. The, the, the earth travels around the sun, then it travels around again. We breathe in and out, and in and out, and our heart beats, and our heart beats, and our heart beats, and beats, and we wake up, and we sleep, and we wake up, and we sleep, and our years are just four measures of winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, our years, and our months, and our weeks, and our days is composed of rhythms. All of our lives are composed of rhythms. And strangely, that's what this series is all about. It's about trying to notice the rhythms that we all have. 
and not letting them uh, drown out or fade into the background. And so in this series, uh, we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about some of the most mundane and commonplace uh, rhythms that every single one of us have in our lives so that, so that the many things that, that you do and I do and we do, we can begin to see them as tools that God can use to further his mission here on earth. Now, that's going to sound really weird right now. It's going to make perfect sense in about five or ten minutes. Uh, but after, after the, the first few weeks, you'll see that many of the rhythms in our lives are actually means that God can use for, for, to share his love with the people in this world. Here's what I mean. We say all the time around here at Hope that we were blessed in order to be a blessing. You heard us say that before? That we haven't just been saved, but we've been sent We've been sent into the world as missionaries. Ephesians 2 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things he planned for us long ago. And what that means is that when you become a Christ follower, not only do you become a child of God, not only do we become one big family, but you also become an ambassador or a missionary for Jesus in the world. One of the last things that, the, that Jesus told his disciples that he gave them was a mission or the great commission. He says this in Matthew 28, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what we see in the New Testament is that that mission, that commission, it was not just for the disciples. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for full-time ministers. It's for everyone. What the Bible says is that you and me, all of us are literally meant to be missionaries where we live and where we work and where we learn and where we hang out. But if there's one thing I've learned in the past 15 years of ministry is that when people hear that for the first time, I'm supposed to be a missionary? Like that freaks them out a little bit. That, that's kind of a daunting statement. You ever had that thought like me, a missionary? I don't even know what Leviticus means yet. Like let's start there. And by the way, and this part's free, uh, I think we get just, just um, kind of side trail with, with thinking we have to know so much about the Bible and God's word and God's truth in order to start being a missionary. You know who the best missionaries I've ever, I've ever seen are? People that just started following Jesus. And they don't know the minor prophets from the major prophets, but they know Jesus is good and that Jesus saves. And they know some people that need to know him, right? Some of the best missionaries I've ever seen are people that are just a few steps ahead of those that they're trying to reach. So that's, that's a bad excuse, but still a lot of us think, okay, in order to be a missionary, that would mean that I would have to start doing missionary type things. And I don't know if you know this, but I got kids or I got a spouse or I got a job or I'm taking 18 credit hours in college, or I'm a high schooler with a part-time job and I play two sports, like I, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to like share my W-2s with the IRS between tax time, let alone time to share the gospel with people in this world. See, I think one of the biggest hurdles to living out our purpose is we think in order to be a missionary, we have to add something else to our already busy lives. We think this means that we have to go on a mission trip, which is great. Maybe that's something that you can think of. But we think that that means that we have to lead a small group or we have to start an office Bible study or we have to start a sports ministry or a food ministry or we have to do something crazy like invite the whole neighborhood over to watch the Super Bowl and then right before the Rihanna halftime show, we Jesus juke him and put on like the Passion of the Christ movie, right? Like I know Rihanna, she loves the way that you lie, but this guy loves you enough to die, Okay. Is that good? No, I'll, I'll keep it for this weekend. I have like three more Rihanna jokes, but apparently that one bombed, so I'll save that. But <laughs> we think that I would love to be a missionary. I just don't have the time. If I just had the time, then I could. And that hang up, that's why we're doing this series. So here's what I firmly believe. In order to make a huge impact in people's lives, in order to expand God's kingdom, in order to live out your mission, you don't have to add a single thing to the life that you are currently living right now. You just have to begin using the rhythms that you already have, the things that you already do with gospel intentionality as opportunities to share the love of Jesus. You just have to start viewing some of the things that you do every year or maybe every month or every week or every day as tools that God can use uh, to share his love to people that don't know him. 
So that's what we're going to be doing during this series. I am so stinking excited. I've been waiting for this for months. And we're going to kick it off right, y'all. We're going to start this series off with an easy one. It's something that all of us do at least three times a day. I'm looking around. Some of you do it a little bit more. This week we're going to be talking about eating, okay? Eating. Eating as a means to grow God's kingdom. Not grow. You mean like, like grow God's kingdom. And some of you just got excited. You're like, eat. I love to eat. You mean I can eat fried chicken to the glory of God? Heck yeah, you can. I don't know about kale, but fried chicken for sure. Um, (laughs) As I read through the Gospels, I'm convinced that one of Jesus' most effective and primary evangelistic tools, it wasn't his miracles, although those were awesome, and it wasn't even the sermons and the teachings that he gave, it was his meals. It was his time spent around a table. And I don't know if you know this, but Jesus was a notorious eater. It says in Luke 5, one day some people said to Jesus, hey, John the Baptist and his crew, his disciples, they fast. Like they they stop eating and they pray regularly. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? And Jesus is like, because they're following my advice. They're following my, my example. He ate so much people referred to him as a drunkard and a glutton. Like you have to be around a lot of tables for people to pull the glutton card out, right? And it wasn't just Jesus. This is something we see all throughout the Bible. One commentator said that if you went through your Bible and took out all the mountaintops and all the meals, you wouldn't have much left over. A lot of the most important parts of God's story and what he wants us to know happen around a table. Food is the focus of the Adam and Eve narrative in Genesis 1 and 2. It plays a part in the fall. Uh, When God calls the Israelites out as a people, uh, one of the first things he gives them is not a song and it's not a sermon, but it's a meal. In fact, it's a feast. It's three different feasts. He commands them to, 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 to feast at the feast of the Passover, Pentecost, and the feast of the tabernacles. You ever wondered why? Why did God give them feasts? I think it's because food is a powerful thing, especially when it comes to our memories. Food reminds us. Food has the power to just transport us back to a previous time in our life. Have you ever sat down at a restaurant and like ordered some dessert or something and tasted it and went back to like your mom's kitchen? You're like, oh, that tastes just like mom. Or you eat something, you're like, oh, grandma used to make something just like that. There was this one time in 2020, um, I had to do the, the funeral for my grandfather. He lived an amazing life. He loved Jesus. So it was more of a, a joyous event. But I didn't grieve um, leading up to that. And when you're a pastor doing a funeral, you don't, I mean, you kind of go into professional mode. So I didn't grieve then. I shed a few tears. Um, But then we all went back to my grandmother's house to share a meal and just to talk and reminisce afterwards. And so I walked in, I was going to go change out of my suit. And I looked at all the spread of the food and right in the middle, there was a big pound cake. And I saw that pound cake and I just wept. And it's because my grandfather used to make a pound cake at every single special event and holiday. He said it was from scratch, but really my grandmother would set out all the ingredients for him and the stuff. But he was so proud of that pound cake. And I had not grieved, but I saw that piece of food. And it just stirred up all these emotions it's because food is powerful. You ever thought about why God invented eating? Like we could have gotten energy in a number of different ways. We could have used photosynthesis We could have like sucked up nutrients through our feet like trees. I don't really know how trees work, but I assume. But no, God made us with the need to eat. Why? Well, I think it's in order to remind us of some really important truths. Um, Partly to remind us of the huge difference between us and him. Does God eat? No. God doesn't have the need to eat because God has no needs. He's what we call self-sustaining. He's needless, right? He has no needs. Part of the reason, that's why I think Jesus ate so much because the first time in all of eternity, he could and he's gonna enjoy it, right? But we do, we do have needs. We are dependent on God to give us our daily bread. Like we need him to sustain us. So part of what eating does is it reminds us that we need God. Not just that, Jesus kind of taught on this. He said that one of the most important lessons in the Old Testament was the miracle of manna in the wilderness. It was God providing them with food where they had no food. In fact, it was such an important lesson that God commanded the Israelites, take some of that manna, take some food, and put it in the Ark of the Covenant so the Israelites would always remember that their God supplies. See, eating reminds us that God will meet our needs. And when Jesus taught us to pray, what's one thing he told us to pray for, to ask for? Ask for our daily bread. And part of the thinking behind that is so that when we eat, and we actually take a bite of that bread. Remember, hey, 
I just prayed for this, like yesterday. And God made good. He provided with me. He answered that prayer. So when, we're, when we eat, we're meant to think, okay, God, you sustained my physical life with this food. Maybe I can trust you to sustain my financial life or my relational life or my emotional life. I think that's why Jesus said after feeding the 5,000 and talking about manna, he got up and he proclaimed to the whole world, I am the, what? I am the bread of life. He's saying, I have been sent not just to meet your physical needs, although I just did that, but your deepest needs your needs of forgiveness and of freedom. He told people that if you want to be my disciples, you actually have to drink my blood and eat my flesh. Isn't that weird? That weirded out the crowd. Like a lot of people were like, nope, they noped out of that. But, but we do that every single month here at Hope as we join with all Christians all over the globe in celebrating another meal that God commanded us to eat, which is what? Communion. It's communion. His, his body, the bread, his blood, the juice, or the wine. And why do we eat that meal? Why did Jesus tell us to do it? Do it in remembrance of me. To remember that, that our need for forgiveness, our need for salvation, our deepest need, Jesus has supplied. See, eating reminds us that God has met our deepest need. But he also gave food and an act of eating, I think, as, as a gift. Have you ever thought about how fun eating is? Like, it's a blast. Like if I we went on a Valentine's date with my wife this week because we missed Valentine's Day. I was sick. And uh, man, I got a medium rare ribeye, like a fatty ribeye. I don't like that filet, filet stuff. Which Jay, so pretend you got a steak and you cook it the way Jason told you to last year. And you get like a perfectly paired Merlot, right? Or sweet tea, whatever. All five senses are on overdrive, aren't they? Like, like you see the grill marks on the steak. You see the deep red of the wine. You, you hear the sizzle of the steak. You hear the wine being poured. You smell the seasoning of the steak. You smell like the aromatics as the wine kind of comes up to you. you. You feel the chew of the steak and the wine kind of washing over your mouth. And then there's the taste, right? The salt, the fat, the acid, the sweet. Like it's incredible. God gave us the need to do something incredibly fun three times a day. Like, isn't that awesome? I can only think of one other gift that's better than that, but that's an entirely different sermon. So, <laughs> you see, when we eat, we're reminded that we have needs, that we're dependent on God to meet our needs, but that we serve a God who is faithful and good and will meet those needs for us, that we have a Savior who has met our deepest needs and that our God is good and loving and he gives good gifts to his children. If you think about it, we get to experience three powerful sermons every single day. But see, Jesus took the act of eating to a whole new level. It wasn't just that he ate and drank. It's what he did while he ate and drank. He invited people to join him. He shared his meals with other people. And who did he invite? Well, the Bible says anyone and everyone. In fact, he tells a parable in Matthew 25 about, is that the right? Yeah, Matthew 22, uh, where he says the kingdom of God is like um, a man preparing a feast, a wedding feast for his son. And uh, he gets this amazing feast ready, and he goes out to invite people. But all the people he initially invites have these dumb excuses. They don't show up, so he sends his servants to go find anyone you can. Go to the back alleys, go to the byways, go to the highways. I want to fill this feast up with the least likely of people. And what Jesus is saying is that that's what the kingdom is like. So anytime you see a table with just this hodgepodge group of people from all these backgrounds and all these walks of life enjoying each other and enjoying the food, what you're really seeing is a little piece of the kingdom here on earth. And we're called to actually recreate environments just like that. And that's what Jesus did. I mean, Jesus didn't use his meals to make connections. He didn't use his meals to network with the social elite. No, he used his meals to invite those that were far from God to come near to him. He ate with, with tax collectors and thieves. He ate with prostitutes and criminals. He ate with the poor and the sick. He ate with broken people, broken, in need, needy people. And it was in this act of sharing the table with broken people that he was able to share hope and to share healing and to share life. See, what they were doing around those tables, giving life to their moral bodies, Jesus used with gospel intentionality to bring life to their souls. And so it's so cool if you just read through this theology of eating that whenever you share a meal with something, you're not just experiencing a physical act, something much more is going on. 
It's a spiritual act that you're experiencing, whether you acknowledge it or not. In fact, there's a really cool story that illustrates this, per, uh, this point perfectly. And it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, but it's probably a story that 99% of you know nothing about. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and it's a story about King David and this guy with a really weird name named Mephibosheth. Everyone say Mephibosheth. See, it's hard, so when I mispronounce it later, you'll be nice to me. Uh, when we pick up the story, uh, you know King Saul who was good and then he turned bad? Well, he's died in battle along with David's best friend and Saul's son, Jonathan. They've recently died. And King David has taken the throne. And uh, he's had some killer years. Like he, um, he was able to bring back the tabernacle into the Ark of the Covenant. God's given him victories over all of his main enemies. After some of the hardest years of his life, I believe that David's experiencing the best years of his life. And in 2 Samuel 9, David's sitting at home one day, just in awe of the kindness that God has shown him. And he says, he thinks, who, who, who can I show this sort of kindness? How can I share this kindness with others? He says this, 2 Samuel 9, 1. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, if you were reading this back in this time period, that would be a very shocking sentence. Uh, because when a new king came on the throne, they didn't say, hey, is there anyone from the old family that I can show kindness to? They thought, hey, is there anyone alive from that old family that I still need to kill? Like when a new king came to the throne, they would clean house. They would kill all of the king's family members and the whole royal court um, because if they didn't, they, they might lead an armed insurrection. They might lead a revolt. In fact, David's way too nice to this one dude in a few chapters, and he does lead a revolt. But the reason he's doing this and acting this strangely, looking for people to show kindness to, is because he made a promise to Jonathan years ago. When Saul was trying to murder him, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan basically saved his life a few times, and David said, hey, <clears throat> when this whole Saul, me thing is over with, I'm going to remember your kindness to me, Jonathan. And I'm going to do my best to pay it forward to you and your household. That's what he's doing here. So in, chap in verse 2, it says, He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive, and he is crippled in both feet. And who Ziba's referring to is Mephibosheth. We actually um, learn about him about five chapters earlier in chapter four. It says, Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. She said, the old king's dead. There's gonna be a new one. When he comes to town, he's gonna want to kill Mephibosheth. I, I gotta get him to safety. But it says that, but as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. Notice that's the third time the Bible points out this dude is lame in both feet. So in verse four, David says, okay, where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Macher, son of Amiel, which is another extremely strange sentence. This is the last place you would expect to find a member of the royal family. Uh, everyone say Lodabar. Lodabar in Hebrew literally means forsaken. Lodabar means land that is not good for anything. Like if you're going to survive there, you have to lower the bar. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, he's at the home <laughs> of a guy named Macker, which means he doesn't even own his own house. So the son of the previous king is basically renting a one bedroom on the bad side of town. That's because he's hiding. He's been hiding since he was five years old. He's been trying to avoid the king for as long as possible. And because of that, he's left behind all of his riches. He's left behind all of his possessions. And he's living this life of poverty and of fear. Verse 5, so David sent for him and brought him from Macarus home. Like put yourself in the shoes of Mephibosheth. You hear a on your door and it's the knock that you've had nightmares about since you were five years old. And the reality that the king has finally found you and has come to exact his revenge kind of washes over you. But he knows where you're at now. There's nothing that you can do. So he just kind of makes his way to the palace on the crutches that he's had since he was five. It says this, his name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground 
in deep respect. Like, I, I mean no harm. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And he's like, that's awful cheery for a guy that's about to kill me. And Mephibosheth replied, hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm your servant. I'm not the servant of my grandfather, my father. I'm not going to start a rebellion. I mean you no harm. But David says, don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I'll give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. And this is incredible. He's thinking, I, I thought he was going to give me death, but instead he's given me a new life. He gets all of his land back, and back in those days, land was the most important thing. Land proved that you were financially stable. If you had land, you could do whatever you wanted. And not just that, but he's invited to eat at the king's table. This was not done. An enemy of the throne dining with the king. And not like the second table or the third table, but David's own table. And it's not just that he would have food, but he would have fellowship with the king. He'd have a relationship with him. And Mephibosheth thinks, this, this is the guy I've been avoiding all these years? This guy I've been running from? I should have been running to him. But it says this in verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Like he can't really comprehend that this is happening. And what we see is some of the shame that he's kept inside since she was little just kind of rise to the surface. He thinks of himself as, as worse than a dead dog. Back in those days, dogs weren't pets. They were like nuisance. See, back in those days, um, if you had a, a physical impairment like he did or an incurable disease, the theology of the day said that that was God punishing you for either a sin that you did or a sin that your parent did. In fact, one day the disciples in the New Testament were walking around and they came to a blind man and they said, oh, Jesus, this is a, a great opportunity for you to settle a theological fight that we've been having. Was this guy blind because of a sin that he did or because of what his parents did? And Jesus, of course, says, neither. It's for the glory of God. So not only does Mephibosheth view himself as socially inferior and as physically inferior, but also as spiritually inferior. And yet the kings invited him, like broken him in all those levels, to feast at his own personal table. It says this in verse 9, Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him. Then you have to work to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, he will eat here at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, so Mephibosheth didn't have to worry. Ziba replied, yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant. I will do all that you've commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. And from then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. That's the fourth time the Bible points out that he was crippled, that he was broken. Like, okay, we get it. Why do you repeat it so many times? It's because that, that's the whole point of the story. The point of the story is that I am Mephibosheth. You're a Mephibosheth. All of us are Mephibosheth. He's a picture of where all of us were spiritually before we experienced the kindness of a king, right? We, we were broken. We were living in a land that we were not created or born to, to live in. We were, um, we, we, we didn't have the power to change our circumstances. We didn't think that anyone else was going to swoop in and change them either. We were hiding. We were poor. We were weak. We were lame. We were fearful of our king. And like Mephibosheth, he was, he was guilty by association of his grandfather. It was our great-grandfather, Adam, that made us deserving of death. But just like David, see, our king sought us out before we sought him. And he returned to us what we lost when we were hiding from him. Instead of death, we too get new life. And he invites us with all of our flaws and all of our shame, just like his sons and his daughters, to come to the table. Right? We have access to him. We have fellowship with him. There's a tablecloth of grace that covers over all of our brokenness and all of our shame. And instead of fear, there's faith. And instead of despair, there's hope. And part of Jesus' main message was that we, his followers, who have experienced firsthand just the radical kindness of our king, 
we should look for people to shower with that same sort of kindness. Like every single room we walk in, every classroom, every dorm room, every board room, every weight room, we should just go in asking the Spirit, who, who do you want me to bless because I have been blessed so much? Who can I show the kindness of God to? Who can I invite to join me at a table to eat and to drink and to remember our good and loving God? See, when it comes to this whole missionary thing, what if it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go on a mission trip or become a full-time ministry, although I'm praying that God raises up dozens, if not hundreds, of international missionaries out of hope. Maybe it doesn't have to mean going into full-time ministry, although I'm praying for that as well. It doesn't have to mean just sharing the gospel randomly, although I pray that we get so comfortable. It just kind of seeps out of us. But, but what if it means you just deciding to take one weekday meal a week and just sharing it with someone that's far from God? You think God would use that? What if it means instead of leaving church right now, you look for another person or another couple and in a non-weird way, say, hey, you going to lunch anywhere? Would you like to join me and my family? You think God would use it? I think he will. And I think as you begin using this everyday rhythm that all of us do with gospel intentionality, I think what you'll see is you'll just be amazed at how much God can use it. You'll be amazed at how lonely people really are. You'll be amazed at how um, willing they are to open up and share about their hopes and their fears. You'll be amazed at how willing they are to eventually even open up about their needs. And later on in the series, we're gonna talk about rhythms that we can do intentionally as we're eating, like listening and listening well, or sharing our story and sharing God's story. But this week, I just want you to try it out. Just pick one person, one meal, and uh, just gather around a table. Just invite the spirit to be at work. Just, just enjoy the amazing gift of food and eating with another person. Just kind of recreate a little pocket of the kingdom here on earth. And we'll come back next week and see how God uses it. Cool? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of being in need to eat because three times a day we get to watch you meet that need. And so, Father, the next time we gather around a table, I pray that you would remind us and that you've met our deepest needs. And Father, I pray that, man, that hope would just be known. Like the mayor of Raleigh would come in a few months and say, why, why are you guys eating at restaurants all the time? Why are, you guys, why are you guys always out in the community enjoying yourself? Because that's what our King Jesus is like. And that's what he did. And that's what he called us to do. So Father, as we do this and we're faithful in it, would you be faithful as well? Would you supply the, the fruit as we go out and labor in the field? And it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Well, I am super excited about this series. Uh, anytime we talk about not adding more things to my schedule, I'm a dad, I've got two kids, I love my wife, uh, I'm probably not as busy as I think I am, but when we talk about just including ministry and mission-mindedness in the everyday life, uh, I'm all about that. What does it look like for us to be missional where we live, work, learn, play, eat, uh, it's, and anytime we talk about eating, I'm also very excited about those things too. Uh, so look, this is what we have. As a church, we're saying this is going to be a significant series to talk through. What does it look like for us to be missional? Absolutely. And with that, we want to help you process through some of this stuff. So we've got starter groups at all of our campuses. Uh, you can go to the websites. You can go to the Facebook pages to check out those things. Uh, we would love to get you connected into a small group community to process these things. That's what those starter groups are. Uh, look, if this has been helpful, we would love for you to like and subscribe and absolutely share this content on the social media pages. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.